Welcome to the Regen Brands Podcast. This is a place for consumers, operators, and investors to learn about the consumer brands supporting regenerative agriculture and how they're changing the world. This is Joe Kyle, joined with my co-host, AC. Let's dive in. On this episode, we have Dax Hansen, who is the founder of Oatman Farms. Oatman Farms is supporting regenerative agriculture through its portfolio of regenerative organic baking mixes that are made with heritage and drought-resistant wheat varieties. In this episode, we learn how Dax started Oatman Farms to save his family ranch, their plans to grow the brand and regen consumption at large, and probably most importantly, we dive into how what we grow where is just as important as how we grow it. Dax is a super high energy and informative guy, and we're pumped to share this interview with you all. So let's dive in. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Regen Brands podcast. We are fired up today to have Dax Hansen from Oatman Farms here joining us. So welcome, Dax. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's great to meet you. Um, you know, it's fun when we do these podcasts, especially if it's like coming from different parts of our networks. Like I just met you four minutes ago, you know, on this call. So I'm really excited <laughs> to like learn your story and the story of Oatman Farms, you know, with our audience today all together. It's going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Awesome. So, you know, for those who are unfamiliar with the brand, give us just like a really brief overview. Like what do you produce and where can people find it today? You know, and, and what SKUs are there? Do you, know, you have like five SKUs, six SKUs? What does that look like? Sure. So we have baking mixes. Omen Farms uh, has um, a, a set of sourdough bread mixes, essentially whole grain sourdough bread mixes, bread uh, sourdough bread for the masses, and a set of whole grain uh, pancake and waffle mixes also. Um, all of them use the Regenerative Organic Certified Heritage Wheat that we grow at my farm, Open Flats Ranch. That's Love incredible. It. And is most of the business today like direct to consumer, like online, or are you sold in any retailers? So, uh, yes, yeah, so we ha- we're, we're actually trying all different uh, angles here you know i think out of desperation probably as most cpg brands are but uh we um so we have our our direct to consumer website Mm openfarm.com where we sell our our SKUs. we also um have a a pretty robust amazon presence uh, as well Mm -hmm. and uh we are sold in arizona um, in multiple retail locations, but uh, primarily the the fries stores and the Whole Foods stores. Uh, we also have a food service uh, business as well, uh, where we sell to uh, restaurants, and we've actually gotten quite a bit of traction with some of the leading chefs um, in, in restaurants um, in in the region as well. Incredible, uh, true well. omni-channel presence going on right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, gonna... just, just on that point, I mean, the, the, you, you'll hear a little bit more, but my thesis is that we need to be growing millions and millions of pounds of lower water consuming crops like wheat, and then you have to mm. sell that, right? And so we need omni-channel, we need multiple product lines. I mean, we, we got to eat what we grow and we got to grow something that helps the earth. Mm. What a way to kick it off. I love it. I have I have three of those SKUs in my pantry right now. Uh, they came last nice. week. So I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to break into the pancake and waffle mix first. Um, but Dax, you have a really interesting story. Uh, this is not our first time meeting, unlike, unlike you and Kyle. Um, very successful attorney, still a, a practicing attorney today. Really cool story with the family farm, bringing it back, starting the brand. So we're going to unpack all of that. Um, take us back to this beginning and take us back to the origin of, you know, how did you start Open Farms? What's the story there? So I come from farming and ranching roots, but my dad saw that there wasn't a lot of money in farming. And so he told mm. us to become doctors and lawyers and teachers. And, <laughs> and uh, so I, I'm the one that became the, the lawyer in the family. <laughs> and uh, so um, you know, I, I joined uh, a large law firm called Perkins Cooey and have been working as a partner in the Seattle office of Perkins Cooey for, uh, I guess I'm, I'm an attorney uh, practicing there for going on, I guess, 24 years now. Wow. Um, Congratulations. And, yeah. Well, th- th- thank you. Yeah. And uh, so I, I've become my, essentially, a, I guess, a pioneer in the law around fintech and mm-hmm. blockchain, really where technologies meet 
money and value systems. And so I, I, wow. I do that and, and uh, lead a, a, a work with a very large group of lawyers who are helping the innovators try to change the world, frankly. Um, and so, you know, how, yeah, so how, how do I find myself in the middle of the CPG? Right? <laughs> right. You, know, I, you know, when I think of lawyers and the amount of time they spend working, I don't think of side hustles, especially in agriculture. So I'm really interested to hear like how this transition. Both trying to change the world, though. The side hustle starts at like 9 p.m. and goes to like 2 a.m. Right, and, and weekends, right? Like it's they, they, you really can't be uh, a, a lawyer uh, and a, a farmer, a CPG owner, um, you know, uh, w- without sacrificing something, right? And yeah. it, it's turned out to be sleep, and uh, but also I've I've had to surround myself with some pretty amazing resources, some some talent to help me get mm. there. But the 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 short version is that. Um, Oatman Flats Ranch has been in my family since the 1950s, but it's mm. one of the West's um, most um, historical farms. Um, almost everything you can think of um, from the old West times happened there, from the Native Americans to the Spanish, the Mexican influence, the pioneers, the Mormon Battalion, Pony Express, part of wow. the stage, you know, homesteaders. Uh, the first ranchers who got started in Arizona were there. Um, there was, you know, a, a, a massacre that happened there. And that's actually kind of how, uh, not kind of that, that is exactly how we have our name, Oatman Farm. I mean, I'm, I'm Dax Hanson. I'm not Oatman. But uh, mm. there was a, a, a region there, actually a, a flood river um, flat is what they call it, where uh, an immigrant family was massacred in 1851 and they named that area after them. That was the Oatman family. And so Mm. I've tried to be really true to place uh, in this whole situation. But anyway, for me, my family's been on that land since the 1950s. um, And it just turns out that farming is really expensive and difficult. And it turns out (laughs) I was the last one in the family that could remotely, you know, have a chance holding on to it, keeping it in the family. And so gotcha. it's like, okay, here, you're a busy lawyer. Take this other little baby, yeah. right? Which is now, a, at that point, is like a rundown farm, not mm-hmm. performing at all. And um, so I took it on. But for me, this is all about preserving a legacy. And it's all mm. about being a good steward. And, you know, I'll be damned if I'm going to lose the farm on my watch, right? People have been mm. living there and farming there for thousands of years. And so for, for me, this is all about... Um, retaining really what I'll call hallowed ground, uh, the mm. uh, keeping a place where people in my family and others can come uh, and, and appreciate the history, the legacy uh, of that region. And I think the way to do it is through food and CPG. Mm. So it's a really great story. And I'm curious to know, when yeah. were you handed the farm? And That's at what I was that time, ask. <laughs> what was your exposure to regenerative agriculture? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, okay. So, um, after my grand, grandma and grandpa died, uh, my mm. aunts and uncles took the farm over and they ended up leasing it to somebody for about 10 years. And it was really difficult. I mean, we'll talk about this more, mm. but the Southwest in Arizona in particular along the Gila River is in crisis. Like it, 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 it is um, becoming aridified. It is hot, drought, you, know, you, you name it, mm. wells drying up. It was just really difficult. And so I don't blame anybody for trying to, you know, for trying, but, you know, failing to farm conventionally. But uh, I just called my aunts and uncle or called one of my uncles one day and he said, hey, we're going to sell the farm. And I said, well, wait, wait, can you sell it to me instead? Because mm. we, we shouldn't lose it. And um, so that was now uh, I'm going into my fifth year of that where, um, you know, they, they said, hey, okay, we we're going to we were going to sell it. We had a, you know, a letter of intent, but we'll sell it to you instead. And so I bought it from the family and, um, and then I just went about just looking at what I had. Right. And it was honestly (laughs) a liability, a massive Mm. liability. There were the, the ditches, there's, there's flood irrigation is what we use out in the Southwest. And the Mm. ditches were broken and full of sand. There were trees in the fields. The the ground was Mm. sterile, nothing growing on it, no equipment. People had come and scavenged the, the, the ranch house, cut down every little piece of, of steel you could, right? Like the the, the wells were broken, sunken in. And so I just went and I took, you know, sort of an assessment of what I had. (laughs) And and actually I brought in a whole group of experts 
hydrologists and ethnobotanists and others. And I just said, hey, like, I mean, is there any hope here for this whole yeah. region? And, <laughs> And I don't think you remember the Dumb and Dumber movie where uh, Jim Carrey is like trying to ask this lady out on a date. And he says, what's my chances of going on a date with you? And she says, one in a million. And he yeah. says, yes. So you say you there's know, a chance. Yeah. Th there's a chance, right? And yeah. and that's what <laughs> you know, somebody told me, yeah, well, you know, on a scale from one to 10, like zero being or one being basically dead and, you know, yeah. 10 being alive. We're about at a one or two out there. Wow. And, and, but to me, what that said is, if we hustle, if we if we flat out sprint, you know mm. we can um, we can take it over, or, or we we can bring it back maybe. And so that's what yeah. I've been doing now. But the the reality is, I looked around, and I didn't know what to do. Um, mm. Turns out, that, so I ended up making some phone calls, and um, I ended up um, getting connected with the founder of Karen Spring Mills up mm. in Washington State, um, and and he ended up directing me down to some folks in Arizona. Yeah, it turns out there was a conference where Bob Quinn from Kamut International was speaking down yeah. in, in Arizona because um, about 15 years ago in Arizona, we brought back the white Sonora wheat, which is a heritage variety wheat that essentially gone extinct and brought it back. And that sort of some parallels to Kamut International and having a new brand, you know, kind of an ancient grain there. So I went down, I saw Bob and I just realized we grow some of the very best grain in the whole world in Arizona. And it uses um, less water, and these heritage varieties use less water than the modern varieties. And um, so I started you know, poking around in that, found some folks who are ethnobotanists and some specialists in desert agriculture, and realized there was a whole mm. new way of farming that actually harkens back to all the indigenous ways. It's just that we'd mm. skipped a few generations. We had lost track of what we could mm. really grow, what the earth was telling us. And, mm. um, and so I, you know, I decided to farm with less water but I needed better tools. And it turned out that mm. you know, Ke Kevin Morris from Karen Spring Mills, uh, one of their investors was um, Tinch Adventures uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, so, pa so Patagonia provisions. Patagonia. And, and so Kevin knew that uh, there was this new certification, uh, Regen Organic Certified and Regen Organic Alliance. And, and I just realized, man, I, that seems to be a toolkit that we could use to nurse this land back to health. And, mm. uh, and so I, I just embraced that immediately and, you know, but, but so the reality is that it was, I didn't know anything about yeah. uh, regenerative agriculture. It was out of necessity that I, I realized regenerative agriculture, conservation, indigenous knowledge, all of mm. those things work together to regenerate mm. a, a broken landscape. And, and that's what we have. Mm. And, I believe that many other farmers are going to need to follow in my footsteps if we're going to have farms in the Southwest. Yeah. I mean, literally the way we're farming out there has not been viable for years and it, it, mm -hmm. it's going to be nearly impossible given now the cuts on the Colorado River. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. Let me, let me pull some things out of that. That was, that was awesome. Um, one, Bob Quinn uh, and the folks up at Karen Spring Mills, not the same mm -hmm. people, but both equally yeah. Legendary. We'll put some links in the show notes. They're really cool. Bob has a great book called Grain by Grain. It's on my shelf. I have not read it yet. Um, mm -hmm. But all, all super sharp people. Um, theme. A big theme that you know we've taken away from every episode, Dax, that I just heard loud and clear. There is is humility, right? And the uh, y'all trailblazers doing this work. You know, you're not coming in and saying I know everything, right? You literally said I went and got a bunch of experts and I got a bunch of people that really cared and knew what the hell they were talking about. And we we circled the wagons and tried to figure out, you know, what what was actually going on. Um, so from from how long of you seeing it in that depleted state to like actually putting a seed in the ground and executing some sort of new strategy? What was how, how much time was that? Oh, it was, was right away. So um, I, yeah. I ended up buying the farm in January of 2019 and we mm -hmm. had a crop in the ground by March of 2019. Wow. Um, Jeez. We had, we had to, because because that, because uh, the, the, the planting season really winter, mm -hmm. you know, in, and into um, harvesting in, in the summer. Um, and so we hustled and uh, you cleaned up the field. So we could, we could start working with the ground. And then mm -hmm. we immediately went into uh no-till and cover cropping we planted a bunch of conservation cover on land that we probably weren't going to be able to farm right away mm. and so we just 
we would start using all the basic techniques for how to start making topsoil essentially. And mm -hmm. it was literally, you know, within, you know, a, a few months or a year that we started to see the life coming back. But now that we're, you know, in our, in our fifth year, it's a stark difference from, if you look at the before and after photos, you know, uh, these, these principles, these techniques work and, you know, we're, we're able to do a lot more with less water and a lot more life and increased biodiversity. So we're, you know, we're, we're really trying to, I mean, you, you were, you use the word pioneer. We're trying to pioneer mm. regenerative agriculture in the Southwest where frankly, I don't think anybody's really done it recently. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think the key word you just mentioned recently, and you talked earlier about, you know, utilizing indigenous wisdom and how they've been, you know, stewarding mm. this land for millennia, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's really important to touch on. Um, I'm also really curious, you know, you said you started, you know, crop on the ground, first crop on the ground, March 2019. Mm -hmm. Had you done any sort of soil organic matter testing or water infiltration rate testing or anything at that mm -hmm. time? And if so, what does that look like compared to those same tests today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... We, we did some basic tests, uh, but primarily what we did were the tests in order to get organic certified. I'd mentioned that somebody had mm -hmm. tried and sort of failed to farm for a while. And so the mm -hmm. farm had been left fallow. Uh, and so um, we were able to get organic certification right away because there were that's no great. chemicals out there, right? Yeah. Well, that, that's, the, that's the good side about it being neglected. But, mm -hmm. but, the, but the reality is it had sat almost sterile. If, if you farm in the West the way we do and then you walk away from it, it doesn't rewild. Mm. It just becomes sterile and bleached out, right? Mm, so the reality right. is there was almost no organic material in that soil, mm -hmm. right? Wow. And 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 so I mean honestly it's going to be about a 10 year endeavor to build it back up to where you know we've got some really good, you know, um measurements. But yes, we've been we, we, we're, we got certified with CCOF organic, and then, you know, mm -hmm. we did the original organic uh, certification. And so as part of that, we do collect soil samples and testing. And we've been also, also partnered up with different universities like the University of Arizona and others who are, are bringing some research to bear to mm -hmm. uh, do additional soil samples besides what you could normally get at, at labs. Um, and and it, is, it is increasing. Uh, mm -hmm. Kyle, um, and it's improving pretty significantly, but it, but it's still going to take a while because, you know, totally. uh, you, you got to build all the below ground uh, biological and fungal activity to really have an impact, even after you put, call it the mm -hmm. carbon, if you will, the, the crop, you lay them down on, on, on the top. So it just takes a while for life to, to yeah. uh, kind of come back, but, but it does. When you let nature do her thing, she surprises you. She works pretty fast. Mm. Right. You know, to me, it's, it's a really good example of like the pros and cons of starting at zero. You know, when you have a <laughs> industrial monocrop system, at least there's some life and you do have the, you know, the challenges of transitioning that land into these new practices. But starting at zero, you know, you get to implement the, all the practices right away, but mm. you're starting at zero. So, yeah, it's not, as you were first talking about, I was like, man, finding degraded land is the key to this game. You know, it just seems a lot easier, but to your point, it still requires quite a bit of work. And you mentioned a 10 year process, so it's certainly not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, one other question I have for those who are not as well versed into regenerative agriculture, walk us through what it looks like to, you know, like one season of wheat for you versus a season mm -hmm. of wheat for like an industrial monocrop wheat system. How mm -hmm. is that different? How do you utilize less water? What does the crop look like versus, you know, the, the regenerative crop versus the conventional crop? I don't mm. like that. Sure. Absolutely. So, look, in, in Arizona, in the southwest, um, we have an invasive species, Bermuda grass. Okay. Mm. And so um, if you put a little bit of water on the ground, the mm. thing that grows is Bermuda grass. And it's really thick. Okay. Wow. And, and, and it will overwhelm almost any crop. And a lot of the modern crops, modern varieties of, of seeds um, have been essentially developed with um, chemical fertilizers and um, f fertilizers and pesticides, right? Like mm. it, to, to, to clear everything out of the way to give those little seeds an opportunity to grow and do their thing, mm. right? And so if you put them into a no-till environment, they essentially get choked out, right? Mm. So, mm. so anyway, so mo most conventional farmers will rip, deep ripping and disking of the, the ground, plant the products, plant the seeds, and then they will um, 
irrigate it and they'll use you know, um, chemical fertilizer and then they'll use pesticides and herbicides to kill everything else around mm-hmm. it. Okay. Um, what, what, and they'll u- usually use a modern variety, something that's been bred. Like, there are no GMOs in wheat. Mm-hmm. And, and that's an important thing for people to know, right? Like if you eat wheat in the United States, it hasn't been genetically modified, but it has been mm-hmm. bred and things have been, been bred for different profiles and yields and you name it, and mostly for yield. Mm-hmm. Um, and so people will be using mainly the, these higher yielding varieties of wheat uh, and grow them. But my, my personal view is that, you know, the, the ground in Arizona is kind of akin to um, it's just a medium. Like you can you can grow a seed mm-hmm. in that soil just like you can grow seed in a wet paper towel. You know, if you just pump, you know, the fertilizer on it or you yeah. put it in steer manure, right? Mm-hmm. And But that doesn't mean that there's any sort of life down there. You've got plants and biological activity going on, you know, where they sort of have a symbiotic relationship. So what we do, which is different, is that we don't, well, first of all, we start with a different seed. So I mentioned this white Sonora wheat. We also, mm. uh, which is a, by the way, it, the Spanish brought that over to Mexico and up into the Southwest about 300 years ago. And so it is likely mm. the case that that variety of wheat was growing on my farm within the last 300 years, okay, mm. by the indigenous people, right? Because the Native Americans grew it. And by the way, that's what gave rise to the flour tortilla that we all know and love in Mexican food is the white Sonora. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, it's what fed all the Western travelers, the 49ers and everybody else who's come through all the, you know, the, the army of the West. If it hadn't been for the Maricopa and Pima Native Americans, we would, they, everybody was starved, but it was the white Sonora wheat. Wow. That fed them. Okay. So that's amazing really cool. heritage variety, lots of, lots of history. So we, we focus on that one because it's been adapted to our region. It loves it. It loves mm. the salty soil, the harsh temperatures, and it just thrives. It just, it just is, is this, this incredible uh, species, this, 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 um, this variety. Anyway, we grow a couple of others, Red Fife, Bluebeard Durham, and then we grow um, a modern variety that was developed for um, health by the Washington State Bread Lab called SCAD mm. 1109, which is meant for whole grain uses. And so those are the varieties that we grow. So first of all, different varieties. And mm. then we um, we don't we don't rip the ground. We we have um, a no till plant or we, we have a yeah no till a drill mm-hmm. where you just lay down all of the cover crops and all mm-hmm. the stuff that you crimp it lay it down on the ground and the then biomass. you cut yeah the biomass and then you just cut into that and you drop the seeds down. Um, we um, have spread chicken manure. Um, but we've also introduced now, we're in the early innings of introducing livestock, literally mm. onto the fields, sheep, which will bring the fertilizer. So we're, we have really tried to cut down on any sort of chemical fertilizers because it's almost like it's like crack cocaine for the mm. plants. We, you need right. to like wean them off of that where they yeah. start looking at what's going on around them. And instead, <laughs> you know, we, we've instead invested a lot of money in cover crops, a bunch mm. of biodiverse cover crops. Um, to and let the weeds grow in there and let everything just sort of come back to balance um, to to build the soil health instead. Um, and so like there there literally are no chemicals on mm. our on our ground, no herbicides, no pesticides. Um, and uh, so and, and, and our yields so far have been lower than what most you know, farmers uh, would expect, but that's my view also just the, 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 the result of ground that still needs to be brought back to health, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, the, and everybody talks about how like regenerative agriculture can reduce the, the inputs. For us, you know, we're still building up to truly healthy soil, right? And mm-hmm. everybody who's, who's, got, who's farming conventionally is going to have years of hell to pay before they even get to sort of a, a point, point where mm-hmm. they can start putting in less inputs, right? So there's a mm-hmm. deficit we got to pay. But um, but it, it, but the so the yield has been down, but it you know I think that over time it it will increase, um, and we're focusing less on the yield and more just on the health of the soil and like the nutrient density of the food. So I love to hear that, man. And sorry, if, um, we keep doing this, ahead. but I mean it really feels like you've got a long view here. I love the analogy you made about utilizing mm. you know chemical fertilizers as as like a drug. 
right? Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to increase your yield today, you could. You could spray it with some chemical fertilizers and have a bigger yield, but you know that long-term, that's not going to help you achieve your goals of stewarding this land, and it's going to make you more reliant on these chemical fertilizers. And instead, you're looking to integrate animals and provide more natural fertilizers and that could lead to new verticals. And it's just mm -hmm. a, such a great case study of, and, and let me preface, I'm not a farmer. I have only read and yeah. watched videos and YouTube. Like I actually <laughs> don't really know what I'm talking about. It's all just concept and theory for me, but you are practicing exactly what I think I know and what I've read. And it's just really great to hear this story. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. For sure. I mean, I should probably, I, should, I need to give a shout out to my farm manager, Yadi Wang. Legend. Um, legend. He's, he's a, He's a legend. And he, he, he's a he's a chemical engineer and a, a PhD environmental scientist, right? And so what mm -hmm. I have found is that we have to take sort of conventional wisdom farmers who are out there who know that land, and we have to take people like Yadi who are environmental scientists and put them in a cage and have a little bit of a cage fight. <laughs> and I'm the referee because I'm paying all the bills, right? And and and, uh, and we just sort of figure out what the practices are. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we have people who are focused on the soil systems, on the water systems. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and in livestock integration. And um, and and so, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't have done all this on my own either, Kyle. Right. I mean, I, I've, mm -hmm. I'm a fast I'm a quick study um, when you're having to fund a venture like this. Mm -hmm. You don't I mean, in, in you in your decisions are decided like kind of like on an annual basis. Like if you plant and then you screw that crop up. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, I mean, you could go belly up on one harvest, yeah. right? One crop season. And so mm -hmm. we really try not to make mistakes, but we realize mm -hmm. that we just have to figure this out. Right. Like there isn't a mm -hmm. model. And, and so that's where I mean, honestly, I view Oatman Flats Ranch and Oatman Farms as a brand as a guinea pig. Right. Where what I've really mm -hmm. done, we talked about, you know, that I'm a, a lawyer. I'm taking the money that I make as a lawyer. And I'm putting most of it back into figuring out a model for farming. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned, you know, fintech and blockchain, but like I believe in the, this content kind of open source model of Bitcoin, for instance, right? And mm -hmm. and it turns out that open source works, right? Like we want people to know this, and so I'm I'm willing to go try it so that mm -hmm. other people can around me up and down the Gila River, Colorado or Salt River, they can do it, but their cost of entry goes down right like yeah. if i can mm -hmm. i will i think that's I mean, honestly all of us who care about this need to put all of our marbles in the mm -hmm. middle and in this mm -hmm. case the thing that i have to put in is you know my problem solving capabilities but also the fact that i've got a little bit of extra revenue from a different profession whereas mm -hmm. most farmers have gotten down to the point where they have they don't have enough room yeah. To even experiment with something new, right? Like they're on, yeah. they, they're on this. They're still in debt, let alone hamster being able wheel, and they can't get out, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. So it, it it is actually a really, it's a it's a challenging question, but like it's got to start somewhere if we want to eat food that's grown in the West. Mm -hmm. Dax, talk about the water implications from a macro perspective, yep. right? And then everything that you mentioned, what that means from a micro perspective on your farm and mm -hmm. how important that is for that region and getting other folks to, to kind of get on board with that. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Because I think if, if people who are listening to this podcast, if they take one thing away, they mm -hmm. should take away the fact that we are trying to solve a water problem. Mm -hmm. And that if you care about the Colorado River crisis, you should support a brand like Oatman Farms and mm -hmm. eat wheat and other small grains that are grown in the West, right? Rather than buying imported mm. grain. But mm. but, here, but I'll answer the, your, your question. Um, a crop like white Sonora wheat um, probably takes around three acre feet of water per year to grow it. Okay, mm -hmm. to grow to grow that about three acre feet. As compared to alfalfa and cotton, which is more like eight acre feet. Mm. Okay. Ooh. And so like there is a very significant savings mm -hmm. of, of, of just that one crop, right? Mm -hmm. If you grow it, if you farm that regeneratively, where you're, you're keeping the ground covered, increasing the water retention, right? The moisture mm -hmm. penetration, you're building all the biodiversity and it's not getting dried out. Then mm -hmm. you can water less frequently and still keep it alive you build those systems right so we, you're able to get to a point where the water even co use comes down mm. so um the 
the so the reality is we can save you know more than I mean, uh, half the water that's used in the West with different crops by crop shifting. And I'm and, and I'm not mm. saying anything bad say, about say that again, Dax. Say that again. Yeah. For, say that again. So it hits hard enough for people. Okay. So if we if we just change uh, the crop selection, the crop mix that what we grow mm. in the West from thirsty crops like alfalfa and cotton mm-hmm. to small grains, we can save about half the water or more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, if you read even just, you know, this week in the news about the Colorado River crisis, right? Like mm-hmm. that, that, that we have overdrawn the Colorado River where it's it, it essentially failed. It's failing, mm-hmm. right? Where we may not even be able to produce hydroelectricity, let alone think about all the species that we're killing, you know, in, in the mm-hmm. river and everything else, right? But the mandate has been given by the federal government to cut two to four million, at least two to four million acre feet of water usage out of the Colorado River. Wow. And and um, the states had until January 31st, the seven states, to, to come up with a solution, and they, they didn't. They didn't come up with one. Okay. So well, the wasn't federal, California was the only holdout. The other California was a holdout. Agreed. Yeah. And, Cal- and quick, California gets well, a lot well of the on water. The topic of acre feet. I just wanted for for those yeah. who may not know what that means. An acre foot is yeah. essentially one foot of water on one acre of land, which is equivalent mm-hmm. to about the size of a football field. So when you're talking about three acre feet, that's three feet of water on the size of a football field per year. So just to put that into context for any of the listeners. Yeah. And I think an Mm -hmm. acre feet is somewhere around like 375,000 gallons. Right. Yeah. And as I understand a, um, you know, an average household uses about half an acre foot a year. Right. Mm. Now, look, there is no getting around the fact that in the West um, we use a lot of water, like 70 to 85% of the Colorado river Mm -hmm. goes to agriculture. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it's easy to sort of demonize farmers for using all the water, but both for <laughs> own food and, you know. Yeah. But it, um, but um, you know, but the reality is now we've been overdrawing the mm-hmm. water for decades. And, mm-hmm. and now it's gotten to a crisis point where we um, the, the amount that's allocated to states like Arizona has already been reduced and mm-hmm. it's going to be reduced significantly further. And so, you know. What I what I've heard is that that you know, one of the answers to saving Colorado was to fallow about a million acre or a million acres of farmland, okay, mm-hmm. in the West. And mm-hmm. so I just you know given the story that I told you about mine, right? Okay, we fallowed my farm. Mm-hmm. All right, like not intentionally, but it was fallowed. It looked mm-hmm. like hell. It didn't produce anything. It's it's a modern day dust bowl. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, so if we can find a way to keep farmers on land. Farmers who know their land, who love their land, just growing different crops, and we create markets for what they can grow with less water, everybody wins. And mm. so, you know, uh, but there, this whole concept of regenerative agriculture and crop shifting has been noticeably absent from the conversation around saving the Colorado River for a very mm. long time. Right. Mm-hmm. That's insane. I'm stressed, literally stressed out just hearing about this. You know, uh, I, there's a great video on YouTube I found. I'll try to we'll try to find it and put it in the links. But it talks about the temperature difference on land when land is fallow versus has a cover crop. Yes. And, you know, to me, if you fallow, what did you say it was a million acres? A million acres. A million yeah. acres. That is going to dramatically increase the temperature in that area of land. It's going to reduce mm. the water retention rate like you talked about before. So everything's going to get hotter. It's going to create a, a, a bigger what's the, like rift in the small water cycle. So more water is going to end up in the oceans rather than staying on land and keeping us cool. It yep. is just such a short sighted solution. Mm. It yeah. blows my mind that that's what the le- legislative bodies are talking about. It's absolutely mm-hmm. insane. Well, and, and I think it's actually just out of, you know, ignorance, right? Like it, it, that, and, and, sure. and the same reason you guys have a podcast is that consumers don't realize mm. the crisis, the American food system, actually the global food system, is facing right now, like in the middle mm-hmm. of, right? People mm-hmm. don't know, okay, like if I buy this product versus that product, that they could make a massive difference, right? Mm-hmm. Same thing, legislators, farmers, I mean, all of them are just yeah. sort of working with what they've got. They kind of kick it away. But, you know, we've actually, because of what we've been doing in the press we've been receiving, we've, we've um, made some um, some converts to this and people are like, we're, we're being, you know, referenced in 
academic articles and other things because we're one of the bright mm -hmm. lights. It's small. I mean, Open Flats mm -hmm. Ranch is only 665 acres. Mm -hmm. But if we can demonstrate, and we have, that it works, you can save water, you can grow crops, you can have high value products, and you can be vertically integrated in a successful CPG brand. Mm -hmm. That's the model. Let's bring more farmer owned food brands into the equation. Mm -hmm. You know, every, every, you know, waffle um, house and, you know, uh, IHOP yeah. should yeah. just, you know, and every beer brewer should just be using the grains that we grow, like we should just be mm -hmm. juicing that up rather than, you know, trying to spend billions of dollars to go get these de desalinization plant built down in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Let's just like grow something, let's just, just grow something we, we can and, and eat it and, and mm -hmm. help those farmers, <laughs> you know, survive. It'd be, it's amazing what can, what we could do with those simple strategies. Um, yeah. So not to shortchange the farming side, the agronomy side, super important. And that's where it all starts. But let's talk about all those other things you, you mentioned, right? A vertically integrated CPG brand with some value added products that actually make money, blah, blah, blah. So take us from the farming side to actually doing that. I know you had a little celebrity help on the product development side. You know, why did you, why did you make the products that you make? You know, how has that been? You know, how has it been going to market? Let's just talk more CPG from, from agronomy. Well, and to add one other question to that is why did you decide to create your own brand instead of selling to a different brand? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Good, good question. Well, let me answer that one first because it really informs the the, the yeah. answer, which is, um, I I could not afford to to farm the way I want to farm to my conscience and sell the product at the commodity rates that are available mm. to me. Mm -hmm. Nowhere near it, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 and and so. Um, I just realized. Can that, you can you like yeah. expand on that a little bit? Like, what's yeah. the discrepancy? Like, what do you need to sell for, and what would you sell for if it was that commodity market? Okay, so um, I'll I'll say that right now, you know, like like the I don't know the exact price. If you look up the, the yeah. price of wheat right now, like organic yeah. wheat, it's probably in the range of like twenty five cents to thirty cents a pound. Okay, mm -hmm. if you factor in the electricity cost to pump the water fuel costs, you know, to plant, you know, all, all the labor costs and everything yeah. else. The reality is you that even a very well run farm that already had all the resources needs to make about 75 cents a pound wow. to even just break even to, to even just make any money. Right. Mm, because if you think about it, there's people who are dry land farming in other parts of the country, low cost, high yields, we're importing grain from Mm -hmm. various places around the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, that when you start viewing grain, like wheat as a commodity, it's all the same, mm -hmm. then the cost comes down, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but what we found is that, you know, to just, first of all, rebuild a farm. And we've been, you know, we're in the fifth year of now rebuilding, rebuilding and then reinvesting in the farm, making it healthy. Mm -hmm. Our actual cogs, our cogs to just grow it, and we're being very, very frugal. Um, but, but, but very deliberate about our practice. Like we're not cutting any corners. Like we're doing anything the very best way we know how to do it, the way they should be done. Mm -hmm. You know, it, oh, yeah. um, our, our cogs are more like a dollar 25 a pound. To grow it. Wow. Okay? So that's wow. Four, four X plus. Four, five X, right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and, and so, um, and not by the price way, cogs, that, that's, that's, that's the cogs. cogs and yeah. the market Ooh. is, that's cents. cogs. And by yeah. the way, I, I will just tell you that that um, when you if you just look up like white snore wheat or these like heritage varieties or grown organic, not not to mention grown regeneratively, yeah, you're right. going to find that it's in that range, right? But like, mm -hmm. and somebody will buy it in smaller quantities at that price. But because we have this real cost pressure mm -hmm. on commodities, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of food brands and and bakers and everybody else. Are, are just using the cheap thing because yep. consumers have gotten used to buying their cheap. bagel at fill in the price, right? Like, yeah. but mm -hmm. there's, um, anyway, so, so the, so, and by the way, I, if I had, if I could have grown something other than wheat, I would have like a higher mm -hmm. value, higher, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah, higher value crop, mm -hmm. but it turns out, I mean, by the way, and we are growing some of those things like agave and prickly pear and some of these heritage mm -hmm. crops, right? Like that we're experimenting with those too. But the reality is with where we were, the context of where we were, mm -hmm. the thing that we could grow responsibly, mm -hmm. you know, and that's like future proof is mm -hmm. going to be grain. Like it can be wheat, mm -hmm. heritage wheat, it could be barley, right? And so you ask yourself, well, what do you do with those, right? Okay, so we've, we're making vanilla extract, regenerative organic certified 
extract. You know, we played mm. around with making whiskey Ooh. so that we can make non-alcoholic whiskey, right? You ask, mm. like, what are, what are the high value items that you mm -hmm. can make with wheat or barley? Well, you know, and so you can make beer and you can make pancakes and you can make whatever. So it was just like, first of all, if we just take the principle that we're starting from the ground up, like let's, yeah. let's start, everything starts with the farm, right? Like what can yeah. you farm in our region? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we get wheat, regeneratively, mm -hmm. uh, heirloom wheat. Now, what can you do with that? And, uh, and so I thought, well, you know, I love to eat bread and pancakes mm. <laughs> and tortillas. Okay. If I, we're going to take a little detour in a minute about health, but, yeah. but I would just say that, that uh, like those, those, I eat those things. And by the way, you guys yeah. eat those things. I mean, some people sworn oh, yeah. off gluten and, and that's uh, honestly yeah. a whole nother topic. But like, if people go back to like the real steel stuff and it's a clean supply chain, they're They can mm -hmm. handle gluten unless they've got 100%. celiac disease. I, right. I, I'm one of those people that you just described perfectly. If it's good, it doesn't yeah. cause a problem. If it's bad, they go to Europe and they yeah. say, "Oh, I can eat the right. wheat, I can eat the bread there. Why can't they eat the United States?" Well, yeah. glyphosate's maybe part of the problem. You bleeped out your gut. Mm. Okay. Anyway, longer story. But anyway, so my point is like, we've got wheat. What yeah. do we do with wheat? Well, I have a secret weapon. I have multiple secret weapons. One of my secret weapons is a neighbor <laughs> up here. As so I live on Bainbridge Island, and I've got this farm down in Arizona. I used to split my time between two. My neighbor on Bainbridge Island is Geraldine Brousseau. And she is a farm to table pioneer in the Pacific Northwest. And she's mm. the co-creator of Cinnabon and lots of other products. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and, and she was on the, the board of Karen Spring Mills. And I go to her house. We talk about how to get farming going on Bainbridge mm. Island. And she would serve me this sourdough bread made mm. with grain that Karen Spring Mills milled up. And it blew my mind how good it was, right? Sourdough mm. bread with a little bit of jam and butter and some tea. Okay. Like you, you can live on that. And mm. Gerilyn does. And, um, but anyway, so I just said, okay, Gerald, I've got this wheat and, and I, and I know that sourdough bread is good for you and good for us. And I wanted to, let's make a sourdough bread for the masses. Let's make a pancake for the masses. Let's go mm. figure it out. And so we, we actually started with wet ingredients and we, and we like, literally, if you're going to be a guest at Gerald's house, we made these products that way. And then we mm. reversed engineered it to how to get to the dry stuff. It costs us an arm and leg to figure this out. Okay. Nobody mm. does market development, product development this way, but we are going for <laughs> the gold standard like what what yeah. would you get in Geraldine's kitchen okay yeah and um anyway so it turns out that i also made uh this pancake we, we have this white snow wheat but then we are you guys familiar with the with the mesquite tree that has mesquite pods mesquite beans on them legumes they no. grow in the west most people you but usually it's barbecue nope. with with mesquite wood right but there's yeah, actually a that. crop there's a fruit it's a mesquite bean and it was a superfood native americans Aided, mm. they harvested, and, and it low glycemic index, you know, you know, amazing, super interesting flavor too. We can grow that; it grows naturally. It, it, it's a it's a very regenerative crop, if you will, in the Southwest. Most people don't harvest it, but we do. And so I took this this um, mesquite flour that we milled mm. and the white sonora, and we stuck it together. We made this pancake. It's this br this red, and I invited. Mm. I guess I, I I didn't know what I didn't know, but I invited Chris Bianco. Who is the um he won 2022's um James Beard Award, you know, best restaurant tour for wow. you know this year, like famous, famous pizza mm -hmm. chef. I invited him down to Oldman Flats Ranch and I cooked him this pancake just to kind of get his sense. Like is is like Gerald and I thought there was something to it. Mm -hmm. And he's like, That's good. That's really good. You know, to, with a little bit of encouragement from Chris, we launched this this mesquite pancake mix and we had a, a buttermilk one and we had the different cinnamon raisin breads and other things too. But anyway, so, so the, the point was just, let's make something that we want to eat that uses mm. our grain mm -hmm. and also that starts to function as food as medicine. Okay. Because mm. the other piece I haven't really mentioned to you, I didn't even tell you this, Nancy, when we chatted the other day is that I have type two diabetes. Okay. I have mm. a one in a million genetic condition called lipodystrophy mm. that, even despite my best efforts caused me to get type two diabetes. And, and as a busy lawyer traveling all over the world with lots of stress doing deals, I just could not keep my blood sugars in any normal sort of range. I just needed a new foundation mm -hmm. for my health. Right. And that's okay. Well, if I have a little bit of bread, I have a pancake or a waffle, I have a, you know, a tortilla, I'm not going to get bored. I can put all sorts of things in those, you know, yeah. uh, and have, have a variety. And so I, I, I made that. And it turns out that, um, at least that sourdough bread mix that we created is the first product like that on the market. It's that literally anybody can make sourdough bread 
with just by just dumping it in into a bowl and putting water in, and you got to do a few few things. But it's sourdough bread for the masses, um, and you know a, the, a whole grain product like this with some other products you know, um, can actually lead to some really good health. So mm. that's why I, that that's why I made those products um, and and launched them under my own brand. But the mm. whole but the bigger vision, uh, Kyle and Anthony is that we need to have a vehicle that mm. could be a funnel for the millions of pounds of wheat that we needed growers in Arizona mm -hmm. to grow mm -hmm. that we could get out to the masses, right? And mm -hmm. and so we got a retail strategy, we have a food service strategy, we have flour, just good straight up flour mm -hmm. as well that people could buy, not just the mixes. Um, I'm rambling a little bit, but we, we were featured in Chris Bianco's episode on, um, the Netflix chef's table. Hmm. Um, uh, Did you know like what season and or episode number that is? Um, it's the first, it, it, so it's 2022 season chef's table pizza f first episode. There's only six episodes, hmm. but it's all about Chris's story, which is amazing. But, but Chris was so generous uh, uh, and invited me to be on his, his special, but like we're, we're filming like, you know, me and my field and with Chris and we milk wow. my flour and, and so people are just like DMing us saying, okay, where do I buy your flour? Because we, we yeah. see your breads, but like we want to play with it in lots of different other ways. So we've actually partnered up with Barton Springs Mill, hmm. another partner mill in Austin, Texas. I think hmm. Kyle, you have some experience there in Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and uh, he's milling our, our flour, our wheat just in time. We're general organic certified in retail quantities that'll be hitting the market soon. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, Joni, Joni at Snacktivist talked about this dilemma of there are farmers out there that want to grow different varieties, but they don't have a market, right? And they don't have the infrastructure. We have the processing infrastructure. So you talk a lot of people in the region ag game on yeah. the grain side, you know, those are the two big issues. It's really not that farmers don't want to grow these things or that even the transition on farm, which is a whole nother beast can't be done. It's that we don't have the proper infrastructure to get them to a market and the market doesn't exist. Well, and on the, to that point, we don't have an organic mill, mm. a toll mill in Arizona. Okay. Like wow. in the whole state, whole state. Crazy. Oh my God. Okay. And isn't, isn't uh, Arizona the second largest agricultural state in the United States behind California? Yeah. So we, we grow, like we grow all this grain, like uh, uh, we send it to Italy and they make it into pasta and they send it back to us and we eat the pasta. Okay. Mm. Um, we just don't, we grow stuff, but we don't eat it. We don't process it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, like why, I mean, here I'm, I'm very committed to regenerative agriculture. Why am I creating a carbon footprint? That, that goes mm. either hauls grain up to Washington State or over to Austin, yeah. Texas to be milled. Well, it's because there isn't an alternative yet until we build it. And, mm. I, and my personal belief is that you have to take these these regenerative communities that are mm. maybe one state away and you, you sort of leverage them collectively until mm. you can build the markets big enough to just do it in your own backyard. And so mm. we will have our own mill, but we just need to we just need to get people eating millions of pounds of grain to mm -hmm. support it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to make some pancakes. I'm going to put a selfie in the newsletter for this. When this episode <laughs> comes out of me, it's a pancakes. Awesome. <laughs> Super excited. About yeah. That. I'm also stoked to make my first batch of sourdough bread ever. Um, we've never done that before, but I will absolutely yeah. give this a shot. It sounds like it's easy enough for me to do because I'm not a kitchen whiz. Um, well, yeah, well, it, it, just incredible just a quick comment on that, Kyle. It, you know, so I, I knew the sourdough bread was healthy for me. And so I, I made my own sourdough starter and I tried to keep it alive. But as mm. I'm traveling around and I'm busy and whatever, I just kept killing it. It's like having a pet, you know, like a, a plant that you can't water, you know, and it dies. And so I went to Gerald and said, okay, Gerald, we got to come up with sourdough bread that some like a busy lawyer or I mean, actually what I said is you got to make something so that somebody, some guy who's going to get his hair cut in 15 mm. minutes can whip it up, right? Mm. And so I really had her tie one arm and like three fingers <laughs> behind her back to come up with a product that worked. And she pulled the rabbit out of the hat. It was amazing. So yeah. Kyle, even you can make a sourdough bread. Incredible. And I, and I also need a haircut. So, I mean, that's... <laughs> um, so, yeah, I could be that guy. Um, so you mentioned that there's going to be some new flour coming to market and that people could just buy your flour. What else is in the future for Omen Farms? Mm-hmm. You know, is it is it new verticals? Is it expansion of the farm? Is it more regenerative practices? Just walk us through what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I'm really excited about the reintegration of ranching and farming, putting them together. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Right. Hell so yeah. our, our animals and plants, baby, symbiotic animals and relationships. Plants. Um, and I think it was Dan Barber. I watched maybe some show on him and he's like, well, you know, I bought mm-hmm. cows and then chickens. Like, I didn't, I didn't set out to buy all these things. It's like that regenerative agriculture sort of requires yeah. that you add all of these things <laughs> to really be legit. Right. Yeah. And that's what we found is that, okay, we have all of this invasive species back to the Bermuda grass, right? Like, okay, mm-hmm. like either we can find a way to like, you know, plant, we try to plant like a cover crop to shade out the grass or whatever, or we could just let it do its thing and we could feed sheep with mm-hmm. it. Okay. Upcycle it. <laughs> and, and upcycle it. And so we partnered with um, some amazing ranchers, Hartquist Hollow Farms uh, mm-hmm. that, that are trying to build their herd. And we brought them out um, last year and started working on mob grazing mm-hmm. in our fields with their sheep and lambs. Right. So, Very so cool. their lambs with regenerative organic feed, um, and, and we have a whole bunch of lambs out there right now with lambing season and, and we're growing that herd. And so, you know, it's, that's their product, but way back to sort of like, we're collaborating. It's like, okay, well, there's mm. a certain amount of money that I can make off of pancakes and, you know, sourdough bread mixes. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a certain amount of money that, that, you know, the far, the ranchers can make off of lamb. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, so we have to figure out, well, how do you divide that up? fairly later Mm -hmm. but let's first of all aggregate it because my Mm -hmm. farm we can grow wheat and we can support a pretty big herd of sheep and and the question is like what else can we do we can have a garden you know but right now you know i'm I'm really excited about the livestock integration with the lamb and then we have this whole permanent crop uh experiment going on with with different varieties of of heritage agave like hohokam Mm. agave Mm. and prickly pear and mesquite and Palo Verde and Spanish um, heritage crops like white pomegranate. And so all of these like drought resistant native crops, they can mm-hmm. survive on with almost no water where, you know, you'll probably drive into my farm. And by the way, you guys are all welcome to come at some point in the future. And you'll see wheat on one half and you're going to see like a, a permaculture with mm-hmm. native desert mm-hmm. crops. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be producing, you know, a, a, um, you know, this unique agave syrup or mezcal or whatever it is that's mm-hmm. going to come out of that. So to me, it's, um, we're, we're like bamboo, we're flexible, right? Like <laughs> it, it, we're, we're going to make whatever, whatever people want, you know, at this mm-hmm. point, but it, but it's going to, it's going to be, you know, like if, if something doesn't sell, we'll just try something else. Like, it's not like I'm committed to pancakes, it's, mm-hmm. it's but that everybody eats pancakes. So like, right. If we just ate, if people just ate pancakes and they just ate Oatman Farms pancakes, we could change a region. Yeah, totally. Yeah, My, and if I can take your answer and reframe it to me, yeah, what's happening? What the future is is that you're you're back to focusing on the ground, and whatever mm. comes from that experimentation, you'll work on developing the new market or the yep. new product to integrate into mm-hmm. those marketplaces. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I'm not at all surprised based on the conversation we've had today that for you it really starts on the ground. What grows in this region? How can I do it in a way that's going to benefit the soil? Where I'm not going to be utilizing too much water, um, and then mm-hmm. work to you know develop in that into different product and packaging types for you know people like us, which is incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my my question is, you know, what has it been like to take that to market in a retail and a food service capacity? Because to me, you have just like every other brand, it seems like we talk to, it's a better product, it's more nutrient dense, it has a way better story, it could be marketed the hell out of. Yeah. especially in that region where you could really tie it back to, Hey, mm-hmm. everyone knows about this water crisis and these water issues. You know, if yeah. you buy this wheat, we literally, you're literally supporting it by X. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, what's that process been like and how do you, how do you grow it? Right. Like going back to like commercial strategy, CPG yeah. side of things. It's been painful and expensive. I mean, there's yeah. no, no, no way yeah. around it. Yeah. Don't right. not right. Alone there. I think Tell everyone says that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean the, the, um, I, I will just say that the, the current food system is stacked against CPG mm. brands like ours. Okay. And, yep. <laughs> and, and, it, and, it, and I don't know that it's malicious. It's yeah. just that like, it's designed it. I mean, I think our food system is designed for war and famine. Mm. Okay. And for commodity mm. traders. All right. Well, mm-hmm. if we prioritize other things like rebuilding health and climate environment and, and like finding a cause, we're mm-hmm. gonna have to retool it, right? And mm-hmm. so it it shouldn't it come as no surprise that it's really painful for us, I'll call all of us, the pioneers, to break into that, right? Like that mm-hmm. we get a little toehold 
and we're not making nearly as much money as we need to to pay the costs and whatever. But as soon as we get a little bit of traction, I mean, the, the product sells itself, right? Like the, the, mm -hmm. we have loyal fans and followers, yeah. right? Like if, if we can be there, that's why I'm so grateful that you guys put us on your, your, your podcast, your, your platform. When, when, when people find us, yeah. the reason is clear why they should eat us, eat our product. Yeah. Right. And, um, but anyway, so uh, for, uh, for me, it was about developing a brand that had integrity, building mm -hmm. a brand that will be a large brand. Like I, I'm, I am, I'm convinced that we got to bust out of this farmer's market mentality. Mm. You know, like the hippies are already going to find us, right? <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, we got to scale this thing, right? And yeah. if I, because I'm not just trying yeah. to like, you know, only like feed my local neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, you know, encourage a saving of a region with, mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland. Mm -hmm. And so like, we got to scale this puppy. So for me, it was, um, that we had to have a brand that had integrity, things that tasted amazing, mm. that made people feel good, and then had a, a reason, a cause behind them. And for that, I think you need a consumer mm. brand. But then with mm -hmm. that consumer brand and some champions, we could, mm -hmm. you know, get into food service. We can get into wholesale. Like we, we could do so, so all sorts of other things. But for us, it was, first of all, have a brand. We tried, by the way, like a whole national distribution strategy because I thought, okay, I've got this great product. Let's go mm. see. Who wants to buy it? I hired a broker. We spent a bunch of money mm -hmm. on a national kind of buckshot strategy, and mm -hmm. it didn't work very well. And so I said, mm -hmm. well, let's focus on Arizona where people, where people get our story. Mm -hmm. And from there, we'll scale out. And mm -hmm. so we found an amazing distributor named Navigrate that focuses on helping local Arizona brands. Mm -hmm. And they got us into Fry's. They got us into Whole Foods. They're trying some others. We have some champions, you know, Arizona Wilderness Brewery, which ex they, were like, they were the mm. world's best new brewery um, at one mm. time. And mm. they put us on their menu. And we've got some other James Beard Award winning chefs who are making stuff with us, Chompies. And so my view is that actually, like, like we'll have a, a wholesale strategy. We'll have a DTC on our website with Shopify. We'll have Amazon. Mm -hmm. But I actually think that it's going to take something entirely different. Like just these mm. strategic relationships, you know, like, okay, mm -hmm. you get on Netflix. Okay. That, that's pretty nice, you know, compliment, right? You get Arizona, mm -hmm. we're, we're saving wilderness, right? You get, you, you, you have to start really a movement. And I, mm. and that's one of the reasons that we haven't talked much about like the Regenerative Organic Alliance, but I feel like there's something really cool happening with these regenerative brands where we've got some critical mass where mm. we get people's attention. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and from there, like it will sell. So right now, we don't sell enough, not nearly enough, to support the farm. Mm -hmm. But but on the per unit economics, which is what mm -hmm. really matters, um, if we sell a product on our website or anywhere we sell it, we earn enough money to cover our cogs and for the farm yep. and a modest margin for the food company. And yep. so I'm convinced that the model works. We just have to scale it up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're... You're perfectly taking us into our our, our closing question, um, and I think we will we will see the state of the the movement of Regen CPG at Expo West in March, which I know all three of us will be there, so that'll be fun. Mm -hmm. But the the question we asked everybody, Dax, and you were taking us right there is, how do we get Regen brands that fifty percent market share by twenty fifty? How do we do that? Mm -hmm. um, I'm convinced that we need to have some champions, some champions mm -hmm. who have who have a scale. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and and it may not be the existing champions, right? Like the mm -hmm. people who, like the people who own grocery stores or whatever. We mm -hmm. may have to just go build our new one, build our own. Right. Mm -hmm. But we um, um, I don't think we can do it within the existing food system. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't think it works. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think the other thing that, that could maybe accelerate it is that um, you know, we, we have these Gen Zs, you know, folks mm -hmm. who really care about their health and, and and they care about things like transparency, where mm -hmm. if we are able to tell the story better and it's a compelling story, mm -hmm. I think that we can capture the hearts and minds of a very powerful demographic. Mm -hmm. um, but right now we, we probably have to cut through and help people understand what regenerative means. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. you know, it, and, and it so we got to kind of get the word out. I love to kiss the ground. Guys, mm -hmm. I love the Regenerate America thing. I mean, in, we just need more mm -hmm. folks like that. I think that the Kiss the Ground documentary on Netflix helped Huge. immensely. 
right? Huge. A gateway drug. Um, so, yeah. you know, I, I guess what I'd say is that, like, uh, the, the current products are hurting the environment and consumers' health enough that almost everybody's going to have an epiphany where mm-hmm. they realize I got to change something and, and mm-hmm. they're going to just go read a book like, you know, um, the one from Bob Quinn, grain by grain, or they're going to read what your food ate, which mm-hmm. came out yet, you know, last year. Mm-hmm. And they're going to realize, Oh gosh, like most of the stuff in this grocery store is killing me. Mm-hmm. And so like, like where, where can I find something good these days? I eat my own grain products and I, yeah. I drink Alexander family farms, dairy yeah. all the there time. I love the origin milk guys. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, there you go. You were in there, yeah. there, you know? And so like, I'm slowly rebuilding my, you mm-hmm. know, health through these regenerative products, the CPGs. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think when, if, if, when I find that health, I can share with my entire network, just imagine mm-hmm. the, 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 the network effect mm-hmm. of, of good health and good products can scale pretty rapidly. So I have faith and hope in humanity um, mm. and, and that like that that we've got some products that are going to get people's attention because the difference is so stark. Mm. It's so mm. true. And I mean, the one of the things that resonates with me is like you kind of go in category by category for your own fridge and your own pantry. You're like, how do I get this re- regenerative you know, milk or yep. grain or nut butter, et cetera? Mm-hmm. And you mentioned before as... Um, the pioneers take on the upfront costs that can get cheaper over time. And where I feel like yeah. we are right now with regenerative agriculture, sort of like Tesla in 2005, six, seven, right? Started with the Roadster, super expensive, very small market. Uh, I think they've made like 2000 of them. And then mm-hmm. as more people adopted and they started generating, you know, different models at lower entry points, like more people started to buy Teslas. And now it's the number one selling car in America. You know, whether you, however you feel about Elon Musk is irrelevant. That model mm-hmm. works. And I think we can adopt a very similar strategy for regenerative organic um, and just regenerative products in the country and it Mm -hmm. it will work. So I I totally agree with everything you're saying. Well, and like think about like Amazon.com, my my firm, law firm incorporated Amazon and took them public, right? Like just remember the early days of Amazon, like people like, like, what is this, this bookstore? And they were Mm -hmm. bleeding money, reading about how Bezos was just crazy. Mm -hmm. And now look where they are and they're only on Whole Foods, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if, if it, you know, you may find it interesting that as a lawyer, as a problem solver, working on innovations of new, new technology innovations, most of what I've worked on over, over my career has been three to five years ahead of mass adoption. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I'm actually not really surprised that like that I'm, okay, I'm, I'm in my head in my fifth year that like, we're still like, <laughs> kind of like, Hey, like we're it's not quite there yet, but yeah. you know, things like, okay, when, you know, FinTech mobile payments took off, you know, crypto took off, like, like then it was like, Whoa, like a, like a real mm-hmm. movement. And, and my sense is that regenerative agriculture is exactly the same, right? Mm-hmm. It's just that it's, it's early. And there's some people who've been taking all the, you know, mm-hmm. the pain, but like, you know, there's, there's actually, you know, something to be said for being one of the early founders of a movement, you mm-hmm. know, and that people will, you know, still come back to you. Like there's gotta be some brand loyalty associated with that. So, you know, mm-hmm. it's just an investment. Um, and, and to me, the only question is whether, I can just hang on my fing- my my fingernails long enough, and my 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 yep. peer companies can hold on by their fingernails long enough for that revolution to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think it can, but mm-hmm. it, but you know, we we need champions. I mean, it it's a pretty it's a pretty sig- serious problem that we're. we're yeah. I mean, it, it's a, it, it's the biggest problem I've encountered in my career, and that's why I spend time mm-hmm. in food and CPG is mm-hmm. because the problems we have to solve there are bigger than the problems that I solve in the normal legal community. Mm-hmm. Wow. It's really interesting to hear that perspective. I've felt yeah, that way, man. but I've only worked in food. So to you to have the experience and the perspective you have across a myriad of industries, I would imagine, to hear mm-hmm. that coming from you is just like, it, it's crazy. And in an awesome way, mm-hmm. in, in terms of the amount of impact we can make, but also in a terrifying way, and the amount mm-hmm. of challenges we're going to have to overcome. Well, back, yeah. back to, I think you made this point, Anthony, you know, or maybe you, Kyle, that like I'm in it for the long game. And, and this yeah. goes back to the fact that I'm, I'm all about preserving the, 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 the ground at Oatman Flats Ranch, right? Like that mm-hmm. my family's not going to leave that stewardship unfulfilled. And so to me, this mm-hmm. is a multi-generational thing. And mm-hmm. so I've got as long as I've got breath to get mm-hmm. there. Right on the food side, like this, this, this. If you're just in it for short-term profits, you're not going to help mm-hmm. the movement. If you're in it for 
you know, long-term impact, you know, like th- th- those people are going to make a difference. Mm-hmm. Man, beautifully said, a great way to wrap us up. And I would say, you know, every, everyone that we've interviewed, I really feel like is coming from that intention, uh, which I really appreciate. And we're, we're definitely trying to be one of those champions to, to move this thing forward. And, you know, going even back to what you said on the consumer side, they have all these wants and needs that fit perfectly with Regen Ag. It just hasn't coalesced into this merger yet of them identifying that it does all those things for them. So I, I think it's just a matter of time and we just got to survive until until that happens at scale. Well, and, and huge thanks to both of you for investing your time and your passion into this podcast to give the Regen brands that visibility because um, you guys are, are a huge part of, of this story and um, we couldn't do it without platforms like you. We appreciate, Super appreciate that. that Dex. You know, yeah. for us, it's really like we have the opportunity to showcase the amazing work that others are doing. Um, mm-hmm. And because of, you know, the, the industries that we're in and the experience that we have, if we can just be that platform to get the word out, that's our goal. Mm. You know, and, and like Absolutely. you, um, once you get bit by the regen bug, at least for myself, like this is what I'm going <laughs> to work on probably till the day I die is getting yeah. more people to, buy and support these products that's that's all i want to do absolutely Amen. cool thanks so much for being with us dax this is amazing man thank you thank you i loved it thanks dax for show notes episode transcripts and more information on our guests and what we discuss on the show check out our website regen-brands.com that is regen-brands.com You can also find our Regen Recaps on the website. Regen Recaps take less than five minutes to read and cover all the key points of the full hour-long conversations. You can check out our YouTube channel, Regen Brands Podcast, for all of our episodes with both video and audio. The best way to support our work is to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, subscribe to future episodes, and share the show with your friends. Thanks for tuning in to the Regen Brands Podcast, brought to you by the Regen Coalition and Outlaw Ventures. We hope you learned something new in this episode and it empowers you to use your voice, your time, and your dollars to help us build a better and more regenerative food system. Love you guys.